All right, hello. How is everyone? Good? All right. We stand in between you and a break, so we will make this good, I promise. Um, welcome. First of all, thanks to Brand Innovators for making this all happen and Paramount for uh, hosting us. Um, first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Dave Gensler. I, I currently hold the position of Senior Vice President over at Basis Technologies. Some of you may know us formally as Centro. And uh, we're an ad tech organization that, um, that has enterprise level software to help our brands or our agency partners that work with brands um, activate their paid digital media. So that's cross channel. Um, and in essence, we, we make the lives of our uh, partners a little bit more efficient, a little bit more effective. I, I would say maybe transformational, considering we're gonna talk about your transformation today. It's good to see you. Good to see you. I've known Jay for a long time. Um, so first, let me give you a little more on Jay. I wrote a little something here. He's, he's uh, known as an imaginative and strategic leader who's helping to shape Diageo's future by embracing modern marketing technology uh, in his organization to help them thrive. His, his commitment to inclusion and diversity um, extends beyond his work at Diageo, including the role that he serves as a board member for the Human Rights Campaign and as an advisor to several minority-owned businesses. Before coming to Diageo, Jay had a really successful career at Procter & Gamble, where I got to meet him. And he's gained valuable commercial and brand-building leadership experience and was named to the pre prestigious Ad Age 40 Under 40. Um, and proudly, he comes from a big multicultural Mexican and Indian family and loves exploring new cultures, music, food, and design. One, one thing I wanted to mention before um, we get into uh, the line of questions. I actually shared that I was going to be sharing a stage with a mutual friend of ours who used to run uh, North American Media for Procter & Gamble. And her quote to me was, um, Jay is the absolute best marketer I've ever worked with. And I, to me, that says something considering Procter & Gamble is a small little company. I don't know if you guys have met them before, but they have a couple of brands. So that's a big statement. So over the weekend, Jay and I were speaking about um, this week back in 2016, I think it was, um, was a big week. Uh, it's, it's when you started at Diageo. And um, you know that's when I guess I would say your personal professional transformation kind of began. So you want to kind of share with the group about that? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, it's a little early for a drink, Sky, but <laughs> next time we'll do happy hour, David. Um, yeah, so it's good to be back here. I mean, I think uh, I'll start by saying that there's this picture from Adweek, so I'm also telling this intentionally, so hopefully someone from Adweek can help me to get it off the internet. Uh, I, I moderately hate this picture. Um, it's bittersweet for me because on the one hand, I don't like the picture. I, it reminds me a little bit of my former self, um, but I also recognize that it's, it, it reminds me of the transformation I've been. So I, when, I, when I came to New York, it was 2016, I had left P&G after a decade. Um, P&G was an amazing place, an amazing company. Uh, met so many of my closest friends in Cincinnati and other places. Uh, but I had to get out of Cincinnati. I had to get to New York City because I had to start my personal journey. I had to come out. Um, and I knew that New York was probably the better place to do that. Um, and you know, it's been a seven year crazy journey, um, but the best thing I've ever done for myself. And you know, as a leader, it completely transforms you in a way that I don't think I understood I, when I was doing it for myself first and foremost. Um, but what it did for my career was completely incredible. Um, you know, I think it allowed me to. You know, everyone talks about bringing your best and fullest self to work. I know what that actually means. Um, the burden that I had before to be relieved of that is just astonishing. Um, but more than that, I think. Tell, it allows you to be vulnerable and let other people, you know, bring them their full selves to work. That unlocks a completely different culture inside our workplace, um, and you know that pays dividends in ways that I can't fully describe. And I encourage it as much as possible. Um, I also learned it's great to be wrong. Um, I was so so wrong. I thought Jenny knows. I thought I was going to lose all my friends, my family, my job, my career. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest to a Mexican, Catholic, Indian, Hindu family. 
so you can understand why maybe I thought this was going to be a disaster. It kind of was. Uh, <laughs> but I was mostly wrong. I didn't. My friends like me more, arguably. Um, my career is better. And now I just kind of want to be wrong all the time, but get faster at it, actually. And at work, too. And so I think, you know, I look back at that picture. I still kind of hate it because, you know, when you're dating and people Google everything, it's not where you want to start. But uh, I do, I am proud. You know, I've lost 75 pounds, proud of that. Um, I, I feel different, more than just the weight loss. I'm a different human. And I think as a leader, I just want to pass that on more than anything else. So I always start with that because I think it's seven years later. Every time I come back to Ad Week, this is like the first time I think I've been on the stage since then. It sort of gives me a little bit of the chills. Um, but I'm also ready to move past it, if that makes sense, um, because I do think it's like the past. So let's move forward. Yeah, I agree. And by the way, like when I, when I, when I do introduce Jay to people or I talk about Jay, for me, from a sense of pride perspective, to watch someone kind of grow up over the past 20 years and make such transformational changes to his life is just, for me, it's an inspiring thing. And it's not because you're sitting here and you're the CMO of the, CMO of the Diageo Beer Company. It is because you're a friend. So um, it's always great to see those types of things happen to good people. So let me, let me ask you a question. You had a, a really successful clear career at Proctor. You've worked on Olay. You've worked on CoverGirl. You worked on the Walmart team. So what was that one transformational job you had that helped set you up for doing the work that you're doing now? Yeah, I think there's, there's two jobs that I think really define my experience. I think the first one was I started on the Walmart team in Arkansas, which is, you know, for being a Chicago kid and moving to Arkansas was a whole thing. A um, yeah, <laughs> but it was the best experience of my life. Um, first and foremost, like to be on the biggest, you know, p and the biggest CPG company, Walmart's the biggest, you know, retail company. And when you combine those two things, it opened up career possibilities that I would have never expected. And uh, I learned as a marketer how to be a sales guy, how to think commercially. And to this day, it's a gift. I always say my favorite place in the whole world is send me to Arkansas, send me to Walmart and let me sell. Like, I love it. And I think it is a competitive advantage. I also think that it taught me pretty early on that for all the divisions that this country has, I know better. Like, there are wonderful people all over America, and I just don't buy it um, because I've met them. And I think to be a great marketer today, you just have to start from a place that doesn't believe that people in one part of the country are better than people in another part of the country. And I think that taught me a ton. I think the second one was CoverGirl. Um, because one, I had never worked on a culture first brand. And at the time, the brand had not grown for a few years. And you know, I could see pretty quickly the issue. This has been a brand that was you know, easy breezy beautiful, like uh, um, you know, America's face always. And, but America's face was changing. I remember going to the general manager and being like, listen, look at your shades look at the complexion and look at the complexion of how America's face is changing now. You know, I came from a multicultural America. I understood this. We have to change our innovation to reflect what was happening in this country. You know, I signed our first Latina uh, at the time. Uh, she was 16 years old, Becky G. Uh, some of you might know her now. She's a global superstar. She was not then. Um, but, you know, it was representative of what was going to happen in this country. I signed our first digital influencer, and it was about taking the brand forward, not shedding its roots, not you know going away from what it stood for, but allowing it to embrace that and move it towards a modern digital America. And so I think both of those jobs were transformative for me and for the company. Uh, and it also let me say, even though I wanted to leave P&G, I wanted to work in culture-forward brands, and that's why you know I landed at Diageo. Yeah, so that's a that's a really interesting point. So, how do you what what would you say was that that the hardest transition, the hardest part of moving over to Diageo from a company like Proctor? I mean, I think you know the, the probably just learning to let go a little bit. Like P and G is such an amazing foundational like leadership company, and it teaches you like this. It's like going to school again, like another set of it's college all over again. And then you go to a Diageo and you sort of want to do it exactly the same way. And then they, like at some point, my, my boss was like, stop. 
They're like, you're too P&G, which is hysterical because at P&G, no one said I was too P&G. Like, I think they said the opposite. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, you're not P&G. I'm like, this has never in my life been the case, but okay. But I understood what he was saying, which was like, you have to embrace our culture too. And I think now, a few years later, I understand more. Like, you know, P&G teaches you that incredible foundation, how to be a good business leader fun fundamentally, you know, uh, how to write a good brief, how to run a good business, how to deliver, con you know, on an ongoing basis, solid growth. Diageo has helped me to really think more about the future, how to shape it, uh, how to be culture first, be a little bit more possibilities focused. And I love that because I think it's honestly a little bit more me. And so I think what I bring to Diageo is a bit more of the systems, a little bit more of the rigor from Proctor. And I think what Diageo gave me was actually the, the courage to be a little bit more of myself as a leader. Um, I, I, I'm grateful to Diageo for that. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've, you've set that tone and I've seen it in a lot of the content that you guys are producing on an everyday basis. So you get to Diageo and I guess in my head, I, I try to think about, all right, what are those short-term, long-term goals that you have for you for the team, and then how do you how do you track that? What does that look like? So my first job when I got here was uh, was the vice president of Smirnoff. Uh, I remember the conversation with the CMO and said, you know, what's the job that you want? I'm like, what's the hardest challenge you have? Which used to be my answer all the time. It's no longer my answer, by the way. Um, and he said, Smirnoff said, okay. And you know, it was, a, it was a transformation job, it really was. And it wasn't, I remember thinking that it wasn't one that was gonna be solved through just another marketing campaign. Because in a way, um, this brand had incredible value. It's, it's, you know, it's been around for 165 years. Um, it, it, le it has a story that on one hand, most people just don't know. You know it left to Russia because it didn't wanna be for the elites. It, came, it brought essentially vodka to the US. It, it disguised it as a whiskey. Um, it has this ingen inge ingeniousness to it that's incredible. It started the cocktail revolution in America. It launched the Moscow Mule and you know, so many of our favorite cocktails. It, it always represented where America was, it, it, and, and in the good ways, and then also in you know all of these flavors. I call it. It was like the Baskin Robbins of you know America, and like, and so the job was to on the one hand transform it again for a new America, but in order to do that, you had to clean it up. You know? And so this was as much about skew rationalization as it was gonna be about what we were gonna introduce next. What did the new look like? And you know, while also ushering in the value side of its advertising, this was also a brand that was DNI focused decades ago. You know, we, we did our first LGBT ad in 1968. It wasn't popular then to do this. We had, you know, people of color in our ads, you know, in the 40s and the 50s. And, you know, if they had the courage to do that then, what could we do now? You know, that's why, you know, I remember the choice to hire Laverne Cox, um, not just as our ambassador during Pride, but all year, because she's an incredible, I mean, award-winning actress, right? And these weren't hard choices to make. They were choices that would help move the brand forward. And, you know, it's been great to see a brand grow because of the choices that we could make in marketing, but also the brand choices that we could make on formats. Convenience is growing, ready to drink formats are growing. So the fastest growing part of the portfolio is cans, is, you know, moving it into more modern formats that younger consumers are wanting to adopt. Those choices are real. It's, a, it's understanding that this new multicultural America wants flavor, great. That's Smirnoff's like center place. And so actually don't try to be like every other brand, just be yourself. I'm most proud of the fact that, you know, three years ago I brought a, a little skew called Smirnoff Tamarindo. Maybe most of you don't know it, but um, you know, when I, when I remember having the conversation and saying, you're gonna let me try all this thing and only one state let me do it, California, and we did 10,000 cases. Just in vodka, my business is nine million cases, so you can imagine how tiny that is. Uh, today, it's America's, not just Smirnoff's, fastest growing flavored vodka, okay? The total categories. And it's because Latinos are growing in America at such a rate that it's not just becoming our flavored vodka, it's becoming all of ours. You know, we're not just the mainstream economy, we're the new mainstream culture, right? 
And you know, I can understand this because of the data and the insight, but this is reflective of a brand that understands where it's going, but has always understood that our job is to reflect American culture. It's fair. And by the way, I can tell you after 10,000 hours of field testing, I've tasted a lot of those varieties. Um, Caramel Kiss, probably one of my Yeah, favorites. really good. I love that one. It's, it's great. Um, what do you think would surprise a new hire about walking in the doors at Diageo? Well, I think first that we have, uh, you know, people just don't know the corporate name Diageo, right? So like, probably many of you don't. Casamigos, Don Julio, Kettle One, Ciroc, Bullet. Like we have, you know, we're the biggest spirits company in America. We have many of the best brands. Uh, we have a great office bar here in, uh, in, in, in uh, the financial district, if you'd like to come visit us. We all go? Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think we have an incredible staple of brands. I think second, I love so much that I think our company and our category reflects culture. Like it's indicative of where this country is going. Um, you know, what you drink, what you're willing to put in tight body is indicative of what, what our choices are. I remember one of my first conversations with our new CEO of the America started, Deborah Crew, and we were talking about tequila. Why is tequila growing so fast? And you know, you hear a lot of reasons why. One of which is, you know, it's clean. You know, in the ingredients, and that you know, there are a lot of reasons why. But the bigger macro reason for me was immigration, and people don't often talk about this. But what's the fastest growing spirits category in America? Tequila. What's the fastest growing beer category in America? Mexican beer. What's the fastest growing food category in America? Mexican food. What's the fastest growing music in America? Regatón, Spanish, right? Where do people want to travel most? Go on and on and on. And what you start to see is that as people come into this country, just like, by the way, if you look back, what happened when Europeans came, they brought vodka, right? Italian food. And those things stayed for decades. And so it, when you start to understand this, you can look forward and understand that the Latin Americans, Asian Americans will contribute immense growth to different categories, and there's tons of innovation to come if you see this. And I think this category is really, really indicative of trends um, in that way. Uh, you also see the rise of non-elk and better for you in a huge way, um, people being more conscious of what they drink. Uh, you see the rise of luxury and people you know, willing to, to spend more uh, because of a beautiful bottle. 1942, uh, and so I love this category because I really think it is so much bigger than sometimes how we see it from the surface. Um, it really is, I think, defining of you know our society. Yeah, I would say after the pandemic, I think we could all use maybe a break sometimes. Yeah, so the non-alcoholic side probably is going to be helpful. And, and we're seeing that you know in, in you know right now in September and October and January. Um, and you know, I think that's a good thing. You know, it really is. I think the Americans are becoming more conscious of that. Um, there's more products being offered, both on the non alcoholic side, but also just less alcohol inside some of the in the products. Yeah. Sober October, dry January. Yeah. Um, you know, so you, you you come in as a new hire. What what are some of the innovations you start thinking about that Diageo is focused on, both from a short term perspective and maybe a long term perspective? Yeah, I mean, we spoke to it just a second ago, but I think. It's interesting, America, you know, the polarization of America, the dichotomy of it is reflected in the innovation cycle. So you sort of have this dichotomy both in the, you have the no elk, non elk side of it, and then you have the indulgence side of it, and both are growing. So you have non elk, low elk, but then you have the indulgence, high flavor, uh, high elk side of it, and they're both growing at significant rates, and they sort of reflect the polarization. I think one of the things that is important is that we don't bring judgment to that. Uh, and I think that it's easy to do so because we might think of ourselves and say, well, I drink this, and oh my God, who's drinking this? But actually, you'd be surprised to know that in, often the same person is drinking both. They're just drinking it in different occasions, right? It's sort of like I go to yoga in the morning, but I'll still have Taco Bell at night or still go out at night, okay? Um, especially in the last couple of years. There is this, you know, we're seeing right now one of the most interesting trends is like, as we think about wellness today, fun is coming to the very highest 
you know, rankings of, of what we could conceive of as wellness all of a sudden. Because Americans are rediscovering that it's not just this meditation side anymore. To be with our friends again, to socialize, to have a good time is a part of how we conceive of wellness again. And so um, it is also uh, indicative of new populations that are more emerging. There's no question, like in my Latino world, we like flavor. And that is a part of what's growing. You know, it's also, you know, twisted tea. You know, this is part of what's driving it, right? But it, the reality is, in the end, both sides are growing. Um, they're both driving it. We're also seeing format is a major trend in this category. Uh, you know, I run RRT, a ready to drink business. You know, cans. You know, that is a convenience is a major, major contributor to growth across the industry right now. And it's because there's more consumers, especially younger ones that are on the go, moving to cities, and they're not necessarily you know, always going to a bar. They may be going to a, par a park or other places. They may be at home with their friends. And so you know, I think that this is one of the most dynamic periods in the industry. There's a lot of change happening. And I think over the last couple of years, we're just seeing people want to try new things. And there's a new level of openness than there has been before. Maybe a new innovation could be in conjunction, some sort of partnership with Taco Bell, because I am a huge fan of that. I think it would be a great idea. There you so go. So maybe we should talk about that. Um, are there unmet needs in the category? And, and you know, I, I'm assuming there would be some. And, you know, how do you, what, what do you do with your team to try to address them? Yeah, I mean, I think if we, we just, you know, tapped into a couple of them. There's, I think right now what's interesting is that there's so much coming into the category that a, we're beginning to see these unmet needs be met, um, but we're going to see even more of them in the next few years. The multicultural opportunity is massive. You know, this is the fastest growing part of America, and there's still tons of opportunity to actually serve beverages and flavors from the communities that are coming in, and that's just at the very, very beginning of the innovation cycle. Um, luxury is also, I would say, we, we see that in tequila, uh, we see that in whiskey. But we're, we're going to see that continue. We, if we think about ready to drink, we haven't even begun to see that side of the luxury for Diageo. That's really important for us that we you know, premiumize this side of the business. So I think we'll see it there as well. Um, Non-elk, um, you know, we saw it in beer first is where we traditionally see it. But non-elk will begin to shape. Europe is further ahead of that cycle. So I think non-elk will also become you know, something that we see more in America expand. Um, but uh, you know, I think the unmet needs will also expand beyond just innovation from a liquid side. Um, if we think about shopping, uh, the C store channel uh, is going to continue to grow for us right now. You know, we traditionally shop for liquor in liquor stores, um, but the smaller store format, as people live more in metropolitan cities, is going to be something that we see grow. E-commerce is growing like crazy, especially during the pandemic. Younger consumers really went there. We're going to see that re grow exponentially. Um, it's an easier way to shop. I don't think there's any turning back there. Um, and so, you know, I think there's an unmet need, frankly, from a, you know, as, as that moves into smaller, demo, some of smaller parts of America, that'll grow as well. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Makes total sense. I, I, uh, I, I'll, I want to get tactical, and I kind of feel like I have to because of what I do for a living. But um, when you think about how you work with your partners, you, you work with your AORs, and then you have this kind of, in some cases, a migration to bringing your, um, uh, some of your media practices or your creative in-house. Some are doing it, some are not doing it. What do you think about that? I mean, I think there's certainly a movement towards bringing more in-house, and we are doing that, right? Like, so programmatic, social, data analytics, parts of that are coming in-house, but not all of it for us. And I think for us, what's been most important is making sure that we get closer to understanding exactly what we're buying, the price that we're buying it at, and how we can optimize. We want to have more transparency around those three areas, um, but not necessarily have to do it all. You know, the volume of it, uh, we trust our partners. And so I think that's where we're focused. I think there's also areas of expertise. We're going to continue to rely on our partners outside. Um, and so I think you know, people are all over the map on this, and I think we'll continue to see that. That's where we stand right now. Okay, I'll pitch you after. Uh, you've already pitched okay. me. Okay, so. I know. I'll, again. I know. Um, okay, mentors. So um, 
you know, you, you've been through this transition personally, you've been through this transition professionally. I'd love to understand who kind of those people in the industry or outside of the industry that you really look up to from a mentor perspective. Yeah, I mean, I'm really lucky. I have, I think, some of the best mentors there are. And um, I don't know, I guess I could name a couple, but I, don't know, I fear naming them a little bit because of their privacy too. Um, Kevin Hawkman, many of you know him. I guess he's you now the CEO of uh, down at Chili's. He was at Pizza Hut, and he used to be my boss at P&G. Um, Gary Vaynerchuk. On and on. I think more importantly, I think what they tell me is what I'd share, which is I, the best of the mentors are the ones that tell you the damn truth, and you know they are the ones who know you really well and guide you through the toughest choices. You know, and you know, every time I'm at a moment of inflection and deciding whether it's a job or how to handle a situation is when I make that call. And you know, they tend to skip over all the details that don't matter and get to the part of saying, OK, here's what I'm hearing you saying. Here's what you're not saying. Um, and based on what I know from you, here's the three or four questions that you probably need to answer for yourself. And then after that, trust your instincts and you know make the decision and let me know when you've made it. And you know I think uh, developing that over time takes a lot of trust, um, but it also takes, I think, uh, discipline. And I say that because I get asked you know now to be a mentor to a lot of people. It, to nurture that relationship is really important. You know, it it, it means that you respond when you're asked to do something and you deliver for them. It also means that you don't go to them with every single question um, because they're busy too. And you listen to them. I remember a couple of times early on when with Kevin, he's like, well, if you're not gonna actually listen, why are you coming to me with this question? I'm like, fair enough. Um, and, and, and so in the end, I think I've really, with these, these relationships are precious to me. And I think it's because in the end, they do kind of know you better than you know yourself. I mean, it's good, it's good advice for the mentees. Um, we'll certainly open it up. I think we've got like a couple minutes left, but uh, from a motivation perspective, give us, give the audience what motivates you on a day-to-day -day basis. What makes you get up? Um, I mean, a couple of things. I think one is, I just came from this conference called Latitude. Um, it was the biggest Latino conference uh, in America, maybe the only one. Uh, and I was incredibly motivated. It is, you know, to be around thousands of Latinos trying to organize ourselves uh, to be a more powerful force, uh, not in a, you know, to, to, to try to advance this community. You know, we, this is obviously going to be an economic force, um, but it, our underrepresentation is obvious everywhere, you know, in leadership positions and boards. And I think it's, you know, something I just want to help drive forward. I, you know, I, I, I didn't necessarily grow up around a lot of Latinos, but it's always been a huge part of who I am. And I want to use, you know, the platform that I have, and partner with these incredible humans, um, to, you know, just I think help build a voice in a community that deserves to be as represented in every part of business as every other, you know, major group. And so I think that motivates me a lot. Um, and I think, second, I think as a mentor, I spend a lot of time trying to help people get past. I can't tell you how many conversations I have where people say. I hate going on LinkedIn, you know, I hate networking, it's political. And, you know, getting past that first conversation is everything. Because honestly, who cares if you hate it? Like, get on with it. Because if you have to do it, you have to do it. And build, write a brief, right? You know, we write briefs every day for our jobs. Write the best damn brief of your life for yourself. Um, and, you know, I have an incredible five-year plan and, I set quarterly goals for myself and I meet them. And I think when you start treating your personal life and your career with the same conviction that you treat your work, um, you unlock a lot of growth. And I enjoy spending time with people when they are willing to put in the work and when they're willing to get past some of those huge barriers that we find ourselves in initially mostly because I understand, because I've been through it, and I really do have empathy. Um, but you do got to get past it. You do got to get first past that initial big roadblock, because you know it's, it is the big unlock. 
Yeah, I think you've just defined for many of the vendors that are in this room, like how do you get in front of a Jay Seth? I mean, that's that's kind of what it is, right? You have to be able to put your best foot forward and kind of you know set yourself up for success. And by the way, don't let him sell this conference that he went to. I think I saw some pictures. I think there was with you and President Obama, uh, Gloria Stefan. I mean, it was the who's who. And then I think they were all very lucky to get their picture with you. That's one, one you know Thank that. You, yeah, of course. Uh, I th oh, I'm getting the red light. Any questions for Jay? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right to say that the regulations are changing and they're, I think that we're going to see over the next few years is a lot of regulatory movement. I think what we don't know is in which direction. Um, you know, during the pandemic, the to-go part of it certainly eased up and in some states that's become permanent. Um, I think there's other parts of the regulation, taxes, um, who's going to distribute that are much more, I think, up for grabs, and I won't comment beyond that for a lot of reasons you can imagine. All right, well, thank you, Jay. Thank you, everybody.